right, guys, check this out. Beautiful snickerdoodle cookies and just in time for the holidays. <laughs> you guys are going to really enjoy this recipe. Howdy folks, and welcome back to Texas Cooking Today. On this episode, we're going to be making snickerdoodle cookies, a wonderful tasting cookie that's really common in the holiday season. So I'll tell you what, wonderful recipe. This is a heritage recipe. This is one that I inherited. This was my mother's recipe. I grew up eating these cookies and they are delicious. And I remember the holiday season sitting there watching mom she would be making cookies she would be making cakes and I would watch the details exactly how she did it because mom's recipes were not only popular at home they were popular with everybody who knew her who had tasted her cooking so I paid attention anyway this is one of those fabulous recipes that I got to enjoy as a boy and now I get to share it with you for those of you that are watching the cook along tutorial, well guys, you're in luck. This particular episode is going to be fun. Now in continuation of what we're doing on season three and uh, in, in the baking series, where I'm kind of teaching you and building on each recipe uh, a little bit more complex recipe, a little more complex, and how we use these leavenings. Uh, leavening is a ingredient that doesn't provide flavor but provides texture and it usually does so through the release of carbon dioxide. Sometimes th other things are happening but that's usually carbon dioxide. So guys what we're going to be doing here is making a fabulous cookie and I'm going to teach you what a couple of these different active ingredients are and how they work with each other and also where they come from. We're going to make some fantastic tasting cookies. Great lesson on this one. It's going to push you along in cookie making so that you really get good at this, okay? So let's head into the kitchen and let me show you one of my mom's fabulous recipes. These are snickerdoodle cookies. Come on, guys, let's go. All right, wonderful. We have all of our ingredients already out here. Let me explain everything that we have, guys. First of all, got two sticks of butter down in there. That's one cup of butter that you're going to be needing for this recipe. On your flour, get ready to write this down if you haven't already. That flour, two and three quarter cups flour. You can use an all-purpose flour, bread flour, whichever you prefer on this, they'll work. The sugar, I have one and a half cups granulated sugar. I'm using a, kind of a raw cane sugar, so it works real well for me. You can uh, kind of vary it up a little bit like that if you want. I like using the raw sugars because there's less processing them on them. And, and, and I think it gives a better flavor on that sugar. Two eggs. Right here in this bowl, I have two tablespoons of that same sugar and two tablespoons of cinnamon. In a little bit, we're gonna mix those together. That's the coating for the outside of the cookies. The flavors, a little bit of salt, and you'll be surprised at what that tiny bit of salt does in bringing out some of those background flavors. It's barely present. You barely notice it. But when you get that clash with that sugar in there, it really sets it off and it's so good. Here I have one teaspoon vanilla. Now something I'm going to say to you about vanilla. When it comes to vanilla, man, not all vanilla is equal, guys. The vanilla I get is Mexican vanilla. It's a little bit thicker. When you first open the bottle, you need to shake it first. It's, again, it's not processed as much as American vanilla is. And you honestly get a richer, better flavor. So if you haven't ever tried it yet, try Mexican vanilla. I'm not trying to sell you off of American products, don't get me wrong, but sometimes we don't necessarily have a patent 
on everything that's the best. This is one of those times. Now part of what we need to learn here is what we're going to use as leavening. One teaspoon baking powder, two teaspoons cream of tartar. Guys, those of you who are in the cook-along tutorial, we've already learned. If you watched the uh, video on chocolate chip cookies, you've learned that when you mix baking soda with something that's acidic, then that baking soda releases carbon dioxide and it helps the cookie to push up and it gives it more structure. There's other ways of doing that, but this is one of the ways and it works very, very well. The other thing, sometimes if you have a recipe that is not in and of itself highly acidic and maybe it's a little more doughy or heavier, you might want something in there to cause a reaction with the baking soda. And that's what we have here. This is cream of tartar. Now, so you'll know what cream of tartar is, guys. That's tartaric acid. If you put IC on the end of the cream of tartar, the tartar part, just put IC on there, tartaric, that's what this is, tartaric acid. Now, where does tartaric acid come from? What is tartaric acid? If you eat a grape, you have eaten some tartaric acid. However, most tartaric acid that is uh, brought to us is done so through the winemaking industry. What happens is when they uh, take these grapes, they'll you know, cut the clusters of grapes off of the vines and then send those in crates in for winemaking. Now they don't pluck those grapes from the vines, guys. They just leave them in clusters and throw everything down into the press. In the pressing process, sometimes, well not sometimes, all the time, in the pressing process, they push out some of the tartaric acid that is in those vines. And it's, it's really more, more prevalent in the vine than it is in the grape, even though there is some of it in the grape. So that's what that is. It's simple tartaric acid. When they're fermenting the wine, it builds up on the inside of the cask. And before they make their nest batch, they have to clean the inside of those. That material that comes off of there gets gathered up and shipped off to another company to be turned into products like this, cream of tartar. So it's just a, a byproduct of winemaking. It's, it comes from a food item. It's a simple acid that we use in baking when we need to create carbon dioxide with baking soda and we have no other acids in the recipe or not enough acid. Baking powder, baking soda, what's the difference? Baking powder has these two things combined with another agent that helps stabilize them so that when they're exposed to air and mo uh, the moisture in the air, they don't react with each other. Um, one thing that needs to be said though, guys, what we're doing here is creating carbon dioxide. You've heard a lot of people that'll tell you that if you make this cookie dough, you can save it for a few days, and bake your cookies up later. Here's the real truth. Once we start, the carbon dioxide reaction on these cookies, we only have a, a window of a, a couple of hours there, all right? It's gonna give up its carbon dioxide and that's gonna be the end of it. And then after that, that dough is gonna do nothing but start losing that carbon dioxide, one tiny bubble at a time, with each time it's handled. So you wanna handle it while it's still producing, all right? So the thing of it is, is as we make our cookie dough, once the dough is finished, we want to immediately go into rolling it into balls, covering the outside with cinnamon and sugar, and getting it right down into the oven. So speed is part of this. We're not gonna be in too much of a rush, but I wanna teach you the right way of doing this, and we're gonna be adding in a little bit of air in that butter, so wait till you see this. Now guys, ooh, let's get over here and start creaming the butter, come on. All right, guys, now we get on with this recipe. And if you are thinking at first, uh-oh, I don't have a mixer, I can't make this. Yeah, you can make it. You can still make this by hand. You can use a whisk, like you see sitting right back here, and a simple rubber spatula. Okay, so very, very simple items will make this as well as a mixer. I like using a mixer simply because, guess what, folks? 
we have modernized in this world and we have power tools to help us in life and I enjoy using those power tools. I've gotten older, I've done the, the, the arm method and now I enjoy doing the power tool method. And you don't need a big mixer either, small mixers, little hand ones if you want one of those little electric guys, they work good. Let's go ahead and get our flour and other dry ingredients combined. Now this is something I like to do before I ever get started with any of the other making. That way it's kind of out of the way. All of the ingredients are mixed in properly and we don't get a clump of one chemical or the salt in one spot on our cookies. It's all dispersed evenly. And this is, uh, there's two ways of doing this. You can of course use a uh, sifter. The way I learned when I was younger was using a sifter. Here's the cream of tartar. Now, why am I not going to get a reaction when I first put this baking soda on top of my cream of tartar? Well, that's because we don't have enough moisture there for a reaction to be present. But the minute those two come together with moisture, then yeah, they're going to react. And in the bottle, you know, like for baking powder, the reason they have to put a, an agent in there to keep the two from reacting, well that's because over time the humidity that gets into that uh, canister will still cause a reaction. So they use a, an anti-caking agent and one that also stabilizes. I can go ahead and get this flour out of my way for the moment. All right, as we mentioned earlier, we had that butter. Now the butter needs to be room temperature so it's soft. You see how that paddle cuts through it easily? That's the way I need my butter. Now let me explain what I'm about to do, guys. It's not just about softening the butter. It's about also getting some air worked into the butter, all right? Part of good cooking making, part of a good baking process, is if you can work it hard enough to get air in there. Now if you're doing it by hand, this is where you use the whisk. You soften the butter at first with your spatula. Once it gets soft enough, you use your whisk and whisk it until it becomes light in color and much lighter uh, in, in its texture. And that's when you're getting that air worked into it. And that's what we're gonna do here. Okay guys, I'll tell you what, let's go over here, get a little closer view at what's really happening. As you can see, it kind of builds up in the middle of your beater. Now, if you're learning how to bake, something I want to mention to you, see how close my finger is to this bowl rim? Never get anything down inside of the bowl, guys. Keep everything outside of the bowl. It will break your spatula. It will break your whisk. It will break your fingers. It will break your arm. It will break your child's arm, okay? So let's keep fingers and limbs and things away from these big, powerful machines at all costs. Here we go. I'm going to give it about one minute to cream and get light. All right, guys, that was about one minute worth of beating at a fast speed. Something I want to mention to you, if you're using one of these uh, electric mixers, especially a stand mixer like this, even if you have the beater that has the, uh, sp or the, the beater bar like this, that has a spatula running down the side. It's a, it's a rubberized spatula they build into it. Even that one requires using a spatula to clear that bowl from time to time. Reason is, you see the material that gets pushed up on the side. See here, up above that, be that paddle. So it can't get to that. So even on that model, you've still got to do this part, guys. And it's smart anyway. You just want to get it away from the bottom of the bowl. Make sure there's nothing in there that's going to be a, a stiff lump, okay? I want consistency in the texture of that butter throughout. So what I want to do now is hit it about another 30 seconds, and then I want to start creaming in the sugar, okay? And we slow it down for that. All right, guys, if you notice, I slow it down and we start gently adding in that sugar. Don't drop it in all at once. Something you need to know about mixers. If you throw a whole bunch of stuff into them all at once, even at a low speed, a lot of times they'll just throw it right back out at you. I'm gonna stop it just long enough. 
to break some of that butter free from the sides. And this will start mixing up and creaming much better. Okay, now that we have those two kind of combining with each other, I'm gonna go for another high speed cream and we're gonna do this for one minute again. Okay guys, now we have this to a wonderful, smooth kind of creamy consistency. I mean, look at this, first of all, down in here. So our texture's really nice, all right? We're starting to lose some of the grit on that sugar. And now, at this point, I gently work in those eggs. Always do your additions at a lower speed. So our eggs, boom, one at a time, guys. Don't get in a rush. Let that egg work itself in a little bit. Too much of any one thing at once, it likes to kick it out at you. Okay, let's go ahead and put in that vanilla. Look at the structure that's forming. Where it looks like it's pulling. I mean, there's no flour in there, and yet we're getting structure. And that's because we've been working it, guys. And we're gonna speed it up and cream it for one more minute. Again, we work in air each time we do this, guys. Now, to remind you, in case you haven't done so already, make sure that oven is at 400 degrees. All right, guys. That has had a moment to cream. And again, look at the volume that has grown on this. We haven't put that much ingredient in there, but what's happened is we have been working in that air again, changing the texture of our base fat. This is an old, old world technique, guys. In the older days, it required a lot of extra arm work. That's the reason these mixers became popular because when you're making cookies and you're working air into them, machines do it a lot easier. Now let's go ahead. I'm gonna start putting in my flour. Again, allowing it to work its way in slowly. One truth I can say about mixers, they love to throw ingredients out. They'll splatter wet ingredients at you, but when it comes to dry ingredients, oh, mixers, they love to throw that out. I'm gonna break that off of there just a little bit. I wanna remove it from the sides of the bowl again, guys. And that way, I'm sure I get good, complete mixing. Now, something I would like to forewarn you about. Do not give the kids, do not give children, or anybody else for that matter, that beater to lick. Remember guys, you have raw egg in this that has been coming up in temperature. And that raw egg in its raw state can cause problems. We need to get that egg cooked up as a part of that cookie before it's safe. We're gonna give that one more spin in there. And that's all it needed guys, just something to remix it one more time. And beyond this, it really needs, needs no extra work. All right, guys, look at this. It's beautiful. It's set up, it's ready to go. All we have to do is get it down on our cookie sheet. Now let's move over to the next station. Okay, guys, I have taken my cinnamon sugar and I simply whisked them together just like this. That's all that takes. Once you get those together, we're ready to get making those balls. Now, I did want to mention something to you. For the guys that are watching the cook along tutorial, you'll notice some of my pans are dark and some of them are bright and shiny. Here's the real truth. As oils get cooked onto a pan, they cook down like this and they get brown. That's not food, people, that's oil. And it's no different than a seasoned surface, like when you have a cast iron pan and you cook oil into it, that's what's been happening here. When it gets like this, if it bothers you, well, for heaven's sakes, just go ahead and season the whole pan. But I'm gonna forewarn you, if you try scrubbing this off, you're only gonna scrub it down to the metal and you'll end up with none of that original coating left and your pan will start rusting if you don't season it out. So you might as well just take care of seasoning it to the begin with. Don't be afraid of this happening, it won't hurt anything. 
Now guys, when it comes to dishing up that cookie dough, you can do it by hand, in which case you can glove up. I like to glove up just because it makes for a lot of easier cleanup. A couple of ways you can do this. You're going to see a lot of people use these little scoops. And they're going to scoop out something like that. All right. And it'll make a nice little ball. And that's a good estimate right there. You're going to want about a one inch diameter ball. And that's about what that is. So all I have to do is take that ball, put it right down into your sugar cinnamon mixture. Give it a bit of a, a twirl in that. There we go. Once it's coated, go straight down onto the cookie sheet. You don't have to press it out, guys. Now here's the other thing you might want to know. You don't have to use a scoop. You can just use your hands like you saw me do there. Looky there, there's my ball. I'll roll it, my sugar and cinnamon, and put it right on my pan. Now one thing I want to focus on right here, and we all need to focus on this, when it comes to how to size your cookies, worry less about the shape of the cookie and more about the spacing on your cookie sheet and the size of that ball okay because that's that's really what's going to make a difference how much it spreads out so guys keep this keep it going just like this if you find it faster to use a scoop then use the scoop whichever works for you. You're gonna see me get my spacing about as close as you want them on these, okay? Uh, any closer than this, and your cookies are gonna to grow together, and you're gonna be cutting them apart. And that, it doesn't give you as pretty a cookie, even though it tastes about the same. There's two different ways people like to cook their snickerdoodles. Some folks like their snickerdoodles cooked light and real chewy in the middle. Other folks, like their snickerdoodles cooked dark and kind of crunchy all the way through. And then you have that third group of folks. They like it a little crunchy on the outside and soft on the inside. So if you would, just keep going on yours. I'll keep going on mine. We'll catch up when we get a couple of these pans filled. Or if you want, go ahead and fill several of them. But remember, that dough doesn't save very well, guys because you only put out carbon dioxide one time. The cookies will still cook up, but they just won't have the same texture as when they were freshly made. I think some of my balls are getting a little too big. I better start watching that. Okay, here's your extra tip for you guys watching the cook along tutorial. Instead of throwing these balls down in that sugar and uh, cinnamon mixture with each one that you do. Just keep making them. And that way your consistency will be a little bit better on the size because you're focused more on it. And then once you get enough to fill a pan, you run them through the cinnamon sugar and place them. And remember, you don't want that coating on the outside to be too heavy. It needs to be kind of light. Remember, this has already got most of its sugar already inside of it. Guys, if you'll notice, those are not perfect by any means. And they don't have to be, all right? They just have to be kind of round and on that sheet. You don't have to shape them. You don't have to press them out. You just let them develop into what they will develop into in the oven. Okay, guys, our oven's at 400 degrees. Spacing is even on those cookies. Let's get them on down in there. There we go. Now, we want to give those six to nine minutes. Keep an eye on them, guys. Depends on how you like your cookie cooked. Oh man, look at these. Guys, we just pulled these out of the oven. They're cooling down. And in a little bit, they're gonna be ready to eat. I am so looking forward. Now guys, give those cookies about six minutes to cool. And look at that. So just get those onto a cooling sheet, let them finish cooling. Enjoy some of them warm if you want. After all, that's, that's part of the uh, reward for being the person that did the work. Now guys, this pan is a good case 
of how when they're too big or too close together, sometimes they grow together like I mentioned. <laughs> there they are, guys. Wasn't that fun? I'll tell you what, you know, the whole baking thing is so much fun. I've always enjoyed this. When I was a little kid, I loved to bake, and I guess not much has changed. So I need to pick one of these cookies out. I just need to pull one out. First, I want to show you kind of a nice brown bottom. Nice and light on top. Oop, looky there, it just broke open. Mm. Just a little bit of crunch. A little tiny bit of this soft center. Not gooey soft. Nice and cakey. See the structure? That's what we worked so hard to build up. You get that cakey structure. If it's cake-like, you hit it on the head of the nail, guys. If it's just kind of soft and doughy, it's because you undercooked it. The idea is crispy, soft, proper processing gives it to you every time. <laughs> oh man, these are good. Thanks, guys. Mm. Pardon me, I just have to eat. Thank you so, so very much for watching this episode. And thank you for watching Texas Cooking today and for subscribing. And guys, if you haven't yet subscribed, I would ask that you please do so. Also, please click like on this video. That really helps me out in the placings and rankings on how people find me in a search engine. If you would, a comment right down there. Comment box, guys. On that comment box, I love answering those. It's a lot of fun. If you have questions, you're probably gonna get an answer, okay? So don't be afraid to type one out. So I'll tell you what, guys, thank you. Thank you so very much again. And if you would do one last thing for me, just, just have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>